This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, distinguished colleagues and friends, good afternoon and welcome or welcome back to our conversation about the pursuit of happiness and interreligious and interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, we had the privilege, and many of us did, to uh, hear His Holiness the Dalai Lama in conversation with three great religious leaders, uh, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs from the United Kingdom, representing the Jewish tradition and holding forth about the richness of that tradition, uh, presiding Bishop Catherine Jeffords Shorey, holding forth about the richness of the Christian tradition, uh, and Professor Saeed Nasser from the Georgetown University, who opened to us the riches of the Islamic tradition, especially from a Sufi perspective. Each of these last three uh, panelists in this afternoon is going to be coming back to this lectern and giving us a full lecture tomorrow morning and afternoon uh, per the schedule in your program. And I commend very warmly, having heard them this morning or this afternoon, uh, that it be worth your while to come back if you're here for the first time. It was a wonderful interfaith summit and a wonderful conversation uh, that begins uh, two days of intellectual festivities together. We move now from the a uh, heady atmosphere of interfaith dialogue right before us with four great leaders to a academic conversation about the pursuit of happiness and interreligious and interdisciplinary perspective. Our goal is to try to unpack some of the issues that were left on the table amongst the panelists this afternoon. Our goal is to try to deepen the conversation with insights drawn from a variety of disciplines and professions that have been engaged in the study of happiness uh, for many centuries. We have a distinguished panel of six experts who have vested a great deal of their last few years of their career studying the understanding of happiness in different disciplinary and confessional modes. Five of our six panelists have been members of the Pursuit of Happiness Project, directed by our distinguished colleague, Aquinas Professor of Historical Theology, Philip Reynolds. And our sixth colleague uh, has been instrumental in building the conversation between various Abrahamic faith traditions and Buddhism. I want to recognize each of the panelists briefly, uh, but not stand in the way to the conversation uh, that we're all eager to hear. Um, the, on page nine of your program, you can find more detailed information on the biographies of each of these luminaries. We begin with uh, Professor John Bolin, who is the Ruth and Rimmer de Vries Professor of Reformed Theology and Public Life at Princeton Theological Seminary and Director of the Abraham Kuyper Center uh, at the seminary as well, author of a major new title with Oxford University Press on Happiness and Virtue uh, forthcoming next year. Uh, his colleague is Professor Ellen Cherry. Professor Cherry is the Margaret Harmon Professor of Historical and Systematic Theology, also at Princeton Theological Seminary, and has a forthcoming title on Asherism uh, in the happiness literature and the richness that that framing of Asherism offers to us, and I'm sure we'll hear amply from her uh, in the course of this panel conversation. Uh, beside her is Professor Robin Fivish, a distinguished uh, psych professor of psychology at Emory, the Sam uh, Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Psychology and Chair of the Psychology Department, and one of our ranking experts on issues of child narratives and child development and the importance of story in the understanding of happiness and dealing with issues of trauma that impede the pursuit of happiness. Uh, beside her is Professor Eric Gregory, a ranking Augustinian scholar uh, who is a professor of religion at Princeton University and is working on a book on Good, Samaritan, good Samaritanism uh, in interdisciplinary and interreligious perspective and will be opening up some of the richness of the Christian tradition, especially through its Augustinian lens, on which he is a particularly adept wielder. Uh, we recognize also Professor Lobsong Tenzin Neg Neji, um, who has been so instrumental in building an understanding of Buddhism on this campus, who has built the New Tibet Initiative for us, and who was so critical in building this relationship with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and allowing us to have the opportunity to welcome him for the Interfaith Summit this afternoon. We appreciate so much, Professor Lobsong, all that you have done in building this conversation for the campus as a whole and for our Little Law and Religion Center. And last not least, we have Professor Carol Newsom, uh, a ranking authority on the Hebrew Bible, uh, head of the SBL, um, Candler Professor of Historical Theology and Old Testament uh, Theology, or Hebrew Bible Theology, at Candler School of Theology. Um, I just call her Her Majesty uh, because of her uh, <laughs> splendor. 
Moderating our conversation uh, this afternoon is Krista Tippett. Krista Tippett is uh, a student at Brown University and Yale Divinity School, graduating summa cum laude from both schools. She was a reporter with BBC, with the New York Times, and with a number of other uh, major periodicals on both sides of the Atlantic and on both sides of the Berlin Wall before the reunification of Germany. Um, she has the author of a book called Speaking of Faith, also author of a new title on the New York Times bestseller list, Einstein's God. We know her especially from her radio personality. She is the creator and the host of a show formerly called Speaking of Faith and now called Being. Um, she is going to be leading our conversation today as she led the Interfaith Summit this afternoon. Uh, we welcome these six panelists, and we welcome Ms. Tippett, uh, who will moderate the conversation amongst them. She will be in charge of this forum, and I leave it in able hands of Ms. Tippett. So, John, I want to thank you for that invitation, for that introduction, but I did not graduate summa cum laude anywhere. I, I, <laughs> I graduated from Yale Divinity School, cum baby, and uh, sleep deprived. <laughs> but I did graduate. <laughs> um, so, well, it's been a big day. I, I will say that doing uh, a moderating an event like the one we just uh, came out of is a little bit of an out of body experience. I mean, I was focusing so much on what was being said at the moment that I don't quite yet know what was said as a whole. <laughs> People tell me it was a good discussion. Yes, <laughs> but I would really love, uh, I think you've all prepared some remarks coming out of your project. And I, I think this is wonderful to, to, to have that kind of discussion um, at that stratospheric religious level. And then, uh, and then really hear about the fruits of this academic project that's been going on these years. And um, so I'm looking forward to hearing about that and adding that to the perspectives we heard earlier today. And if you would want to say something about what you heard in the conversation, what struck you, what surprised you, I would love to hear that personally. So um, I don't know, do we want to just do it the boring way and start it? one end of the table and move back towards me? Right. I'm happy to because okay. I did understand my assignment primarily as to listen this afternoon and from the perspective of the work that I have been doing to find questions that I thought were good for, for following up. So um, that's primarily what I'll be doing. And what I did was to pick out six themes um, that I thought were provocative uh, and that perhaps would be worth further conversation through our particular perspectives. I was struck, first of all, by Rabbi Sachs' comments that, uh, he, uh, troping on Tolstoy, that in fact all happy families are not alike and making a case for the multiplicity and the plurality of ways in which happiness is culturally realized and thought about. And yet as I listened to all of the, uh, the speakers, I thought I'm hearing a lot more commonality. I'm hearing some very fundamental agreements across cultures, across religions, about not only what the nature of happiness is, but also its relationship to being human and even in the modes of cultivating it. So I heard differences in nuance more than in substance. But I did pick two that I thought might be a profitable further conversation. One was the relationship of the body and the mind. Everyone agreed that both are involved, but I did hear some difference as to the emphasis that was placed on happiness in relationship to embodiment or to the mind. The other uh, slight difference in nuance was whether the primary locus for cultivation is in the individual or in the social relational. Again, everyone would include both, but there did seem to be some difference as to what the starting point was or where one first discovers happiness. Second thing, um, I was struck by the fact there was such general agreement that we are made for happiness. That is, I think, not a position that would go unchallenged by the world as a whole. And the fact that in the religious discourse there was such unanimity that we are made for happiness, that that struck me as a profound claim. But I was also struck by the fact 
that although people are, in, are made for happiness, in general, we do not become profoundly happy by accident. We actually don't stumble upon happiness, according to those I heard today, but instead it was related closely to discipline and to practice. And these are oftentimes thought of as being, at best, anhedonic, that is, not fun. So the way to happiness seems to be, at least in large part, through discipline and practice. Also, through teaching, learning, and reflection. We tend to think of happiness as having to do with the, the general emotion or disposition, but we were being told a lot about teaching, learning, reflection. And yet, happiness is something that is available to all. So I thought that the interesting point was that, in a sense, to have happy, we cannot attain happiness without also obtaining insight and discernment. And we cannot have happiness without, in a sense, experiencing it through practice. So a very interesting model of knowledge, discipline, and emotional experience. Third thing, very interested about the question in relating happiness or the pursuit of happiness to the language of rights. Now, the conversation took a particular turn, and it didn't get back to the context of the Declaration of Independence. Because there, of course, it's paired with life and liberty in a context where all three were seen as being threatened. Now, Bishop Jeffrey Shorey did, several times in the conversation, establish the connection between the human beings being created for happiness and the threat of injustice. So one thing that we might pick up and continue are the ethical dimensions of happiness. Fourth, uh, a word that hovered close in many of the conversations, but that I was surprised I didn't see, uh, hear as often as I expected, and that was gratitude. Uh, the connection between the experience of gratitude and happiness, I think is implicit in the connection that was made with joyful worship, but perhaps we might explore that further as well. Fifth, the, the focus was rightly on the human's relationship to happiness, but here's where I, as a biblical scholar, had my ears perked up. I wondered if I was going to hear much about whether our religious traditions envisions God as happy. There are sometimes references to rejoicing in heaven, of God's being pleased, but I was also thinking about the, the theme of creation, and Bishop Sachs uh, touched upon this uh, in part, but creation, the making of something beautiful, is a deep source of happiness. And so I think that Rabbi Sachs, uh, drawing our attention to Genesis and to God's declaring the created world good seven times, teaches us perhaps an avenue for thinking about divine happiness. That leads finally to the last point about whether we think of non-human nature as having the capacity for happiness and joy, or whether that would just be merely a sentimental projection. So I go to the Bible again. I hear the morning stars shouting for joy, the waves clapping their hands, the trees also, the mountains, hills, animals, birds joining humans in joyful praise. The earth can also be said to languish. And so today, as the speakers touched on the relationship between happiness and environmentalism, I thought it might again be worth our exploring the resources of our religious tradition for using the language of happiness to talk about a broader community that encompasses not just the human world, but all creation. I, al yes. I also <coughs> knew that our assignment was to listen to the speakers earlier this afternoon and to reflect upon the comments that we heard. But unfortunately, I uh, only was able to hear a few segments because I had to c come in and out of the arena, uh, you know, the various uh, matters related to the visit kept me pulling out of the arena. So I on, actually only heard a few. So uh, 
one comment uh, that His Holiness the Dalai Lama and others uh, uh, made uh, was to do with the change, the happiness has to come from within, you know, that not from the external. Uh, the pursuit for happiness is not through the acquisition of material or the having the status or uh, reputation and so forth, but it has to come from within, which to me seems it really speaks to the kind of the tr tradition that, uh, that I come from, the, from, from the Buddhist tradition, where the, it is uh, accepted, you know, almost like the, the fact that uh, each one of us wants to be happy. You know, this is, there's, there's no question about everyone wants to have this deep sense of fulfillment or the flourishing, uh, happiness in the sense of uh, flourishing, you know, not some kind of light-headed uh, pleasure, or the, but rather a deep sense of fulfillment. Uh, and uh, that has to come through inner transformation. Uh, in fact, one of the great Tibetan yogis, the great Tibetan masters, uh, he says that, uh, that Choshen uh, <coughs> that he, he says that uh, without cultivating contentment within, pursuing for happiness out, outside or the externally is simply the you know, cause of uh, the suffering, the sam samsara, the more suffering. And I think that uh, related to that, we can uh, also uh, see the various comments that our speakers uh, this afternoon made, you know, had to do with uh, the greed, the desire, you know, that uh, that goes, um, you know, when we uh, focus solely on external sources for our well-being or happiness. Um, uh, Franz De Waal, uh, who actually will be speaking tomorrow, um, I'm sure that he will talk uh, about this. Um, you know, he begins his book, latest book, uh, The Age of Empathy actually saying that the greed is out, empathy is in. You know, to make a case that we as living beings, you know, not just human beings, that living beings, animals included, uh, um, that we find, you know, the, uh, the greatest room, the possibility for survival, you know, th in empathy, the when we are able to empathize with others when we are able to connect and relate to others, uh, not by simply focusing on our own uh, achievements, our own goals. You know, that's, uh, the he, he makes a very strong case about uh, how the greed almost brought the kind of the to, to total collapse of our economy. You know, that, that had to do a lot with the greed, you know, that this uh, perhaps has to do with uh, the certain kind of the policies that, the f that this, uh, you know, f uh, free ec economy, you know, may have many wonderful uh, virtues, but if it is totally unregulated, totally, you know, uh, imbalanced, that can actually, that greed can lead to uh, a great destruction, uh, that instead of that bringing inner fulfillment, actually can lead to you know, total chaos. So that, uh, to me, that message uh, that they were all sharing uh, seems uh, to um, be the very heart of the most of the spiritual traditions, that in fact, that uh, the happiness unf unfolds when we are content with ourselves, you know, the deep contentment. And how to pursue that, uh, again, in all the speakers um, that uh, I heard that the, the pursuit for that kind of the inner transformation or the inner change that leads to deeper sense of fulfillment and happiness has to do with somehow kind of finding a uh, space, if you will, where we are not just you know, uh, running after or chasing after those external goals. Yet they, 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 they talked about you know, th having the space, this, uh, like the, the Ramadan or the, you know, finding f the time for prayers um, and so forth. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, certainly, the, as uh, Krista, that you mentioned the about the meditation, the, the, you know, that certain training 
uh, of, of bringing inner change has to do with this meditative tradition has to do with uh, you know calming our stress you know that a lot of this kind of the, the emotional kind of the uh, congestion of our mind you know the whether it's the greed or anger or jealousy you know the fears and worries and so forth when our mind is just uh, you know bombarded with this kind of emotions there is no peace there is no joy there is no happiness there's so the 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 idea of the you know, initial kind of connection or the initially um, experiencing this peace uh, comes from finding a moment to be silent to kind of calm this inner chatter or the you know that constant chatter of the mind that if you when you calm then that it's a certain sense of calm or the peace joy unfolds. What it tells uh, is that we have the capacity, you know, we all have the capacity of to experience a deeper sense of joy and happiness and fulfillment. That, that it, uh, it takes into account that the unhappiness is the result of our destructive emotions. If we can transform these destructive emotions of anger and jealousy and greed, that happiness unfolds from within it is our natural resource you know that that, that the, the the deep nature of our mind is uh, uh, is pure uh, according to the Buddhist tradition and uh, it's uh, it uh, has that potential to uh, be uh, fully kind of uh, have a sense of fulfillment that but it's the attachment anger jealousy and that all that kind of that inner chatter that uh, destructive emotions. When they dominate our mind and lives, then we lose the sense of peace. And uh, and again, I think that it has a lot uh, to do with our relationship to others, our actions. So there is certainly a, an ethical dimension to it. But how to bring about that change is it's a you know um, a, a it's it's a difficult question. And uh, you know the, the the secret is in bringing inner change. That's the message I heard. Uh, maybe picking up on a word of my colleague, Carl Newsom, I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to our hosts and speakers this afternoon. Um, Emery is a great host for someone who's been coming here for many years now for this happiness project, and I don't want this to sound ungrateful, but I wish we would have been given signed Dalai Lama visors to protect yes, us really. from the uh, headlights uh, facing us right now. So I'm going to have to look down at my notes because uh, it's difficult to do both at the same time. Um, as John Witte mentioned, I spent a lot of my life in the fifth century uh, wrestling with a master psychologist of the Christian tradition, Augustine of Hippo, trying to inhabit his enchanted world. Uh, he not only professed things to be sacred, he perceived them as sacred. And at times I feel a kind of dizziness of time travel, trying to enter the deep patterns of thought um, of another religion, especially uh, one sometimes thought to be world-denying, uh, despite an accent on compassion I think Buddhism and Christianity share this uh, reputation. Uh, you'll be happy to know, uh, happy, that this is not a lecture on Augustine. Um, <laughs> but in reflecting uh, on this afternoon's event, um, his focus on unhappiness, uh, dare I say his obsession with unhappiness and the reasons our lives don't go well were with me. Uh, he tried to go beneath the surface um, moving away, I think, from trying just to be clever, the philosophies that failed him, to learning about wisdom, which I think was also in the spirit of um, this afternoon. He was a middle-class kid from the margins of empire, but I tell my students that he was the rock star of late antiquity. They should think of him as the Dalai Lama, Socrates, and Bill Clinton rolled into one. Uh, he had spiritual greatness combined with <laughs> philosophical instincts and political savvy. He could fill the Roman version of Emery's uh, basketball stadium. For Augustine, human animals are rather lofty beings, um, but we face serious difficulty with our desires and our intellect, our propensity for self-love and self-deception. He called this sin, uh, a word I don't think we've heard yet. 
Therapies might help us, but there is no easy cure. It's as much the evil we bring upon ourselves as those things that are beyond our control. I think it's important to note for him it was not the body that was the source of the problem. He has a wonderful image of, he says, when angels fall, they fall all the way down because they're pure intellects. Human beings fall slowly because our bodies somehow protect us from ourselves. And it's the source of our redemption within the Christian worldview of having a body. God becomes a body. And through Jesus and the incarnation, we are resurrected into an embodied life. It's a very fleshly, carnal religion. Right? Um, but despite his reputation as a pessimist, Augustine was consumed with our happiness and virtue in this life. He imagined the ethical and spiritual life as learning to desire well, stretching our souls beyond what he thought was our tendency towards turning inward into a black hole of privacy, closing ourselves to others and to God, who he thought was the source of all things and the destiny of all things. But he could claim that in order to love the God we do not see, we begin by loving the neighbor we do see. And we love God in loving all that God loves. Right? He thought this was really hard. And he tried to, I think, create a spirituality for the ordinary person during a very violent time of a failing empire unsure about its deepest commitments. Right? His rhetoric of love was a watershed. I think it transformed classical society into a very different moral and political universe, still with us today in certain humanitarian impulses uh, within Western Christianity. He, he argued that evil was not as fundamental as good. The problem comes in thinking about how to desire goodness without grasping it or stealing it. That you may know his famous talk about stealing pears. My students think, what's the big deal? It's a metaphor for stealing good rather than accepting things as a gift, of being liberated from our slavery to illusions. I think there's a lot of analogies for interreligious dialogue here. So the problem for Augustine is not our lack of desire, but our restless desires are torn in too many directions. Now, he shopped around a lot of religions himself. <laughs> he was a consumer of religions. I thought about this today with the reference to consumer society. We can adopt a consumer mentality towards religion, which I think can be uh, dangerous. Um, Augustine was very critical uh, after his own consumer mentality of those who just tried to find religions that make them feel good, that didn't demand things of them in terms of discipline and practice. Now, his own efforts at interreligious dialogue or interfaith summits with Platonists, <laughs> with Stoics, with Jews, and fellow Christians he thought were going to hell, we're not always models of charity or charitable <laughs> engagement. But for better or worse, I think he shaped Western Christianity and our notions of religion itself. Okay? Now, for His Holiness the Dalai Lama, happiness is what we all seek, whether we know it or not, something he shares with Augustine. Whatever we are pursuing, we pursue it because at some level, we think its attainment will bring us happiness. But genuine happiness, I take it that His Holiness believes, consists in inner peace, which comes from experiencing and acting on concern for others or alternatively, working to cultivate such concern. So happiness starts small, and is initially maybe even a selfish pursuit, but blossoms into a work to work tirelessly on behalf of others. He has famously said, the Dalai Lama, that if you're going to be selfish, be wisely selfish, which means to cultivate compassion. Or as Augustine might say, you can't love everyone, but you can love anyone. And sometimes we have to learn to love ourselves. Interreligious dialogue, and I'll just end with two points, is a dangerous and risky enterprise. On the one hand, I think we can emphasize sameness, which tempts us to see other people only in light of our own beliefs and practices. Or we can emphasize difference, which tempts us to demonize others or portray them only in terms of what we most fear about them. It takes a lot of work to avoid trivial generalization and get to the point of achieving clarity about disagreement, even when their apparent similarities exist, like an emphasis on spirituality as a journey or pilgrimage, or compassion as being a central virtue. For some, the diversity of our world makes them more aware of their particular identity. And I take this 
in terms of the Dalai Lama's remarks today about his reading of the New Testament, his conversations with Thomas Merton. But for others, globalization and pluralism, I think, can make us all the same. It doesn't matter if you shop at Target or Walmart, you get the same things. There's a way in which pluralism can homogenize our identities by picking out trivial similarities. I just returned from a conference on abortion, and it reminded me of many conferences I've been to on Middle East peace. There's so much discussion of process and the virtues of the process, which I agree are important in terms of tolerance and listening, that the substance of the issue is avoided. And I, I'm not sure we're at a point yet in interfaith dialogue to raise the questions of substance that I think my colleagues were starting to raise. Religion is chic today, but a recent Pew survey found that religious illiteracy is also widespread, something that doesn't surprise a professor of religion. One of my favorite findings, not in that study, was that 15% of Americans think Joan of Arc is Noah's wife. <laughs> oh! Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> 75% of Americans, 75% of Americans think the Bible teaches God helps those who help themselves, which I think is precisely actually counter to the Christian message, right? I try to get undergraduates from diverse backgrounds interested in religion and theology, even those beliefs that Protestants have tended to think are the most important thing about religion rather than practice. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of desperate interest, even in beliefs today. I know Lord Sachs said theology is boring today, but I think he was joking. Um, Robert Putnam's new book on religion, I, d I think, does show that the vast majority of Americans don't care about doctrine anymore. Many of my students are, are identify as spiritual, not religious, sort of like Barack Obama's mother. Some have convictions, but they're not sure why. Some doubt. They aren't sure why, some don't care, they're suspicious of those who do. They like points of view, and I have to say they like Buddhism because they think it doesn't involve beliefs. It's tolerant. It's a tolerant religion for a tolerant society. Now let me end. I confess ambivalence about this phenomena. Ideas have consequences, which I think is the hope of every young humanities professor. I worry about we traffic in cliches that the West can give us science and the East can give us wisdom, right? The effort to locate something that underlies all religions, either a belief, a divine reality, a general spirituality, is central to a popular pluralist paradigm. It's a desire for a global ethic that often underlies interreligious dialogue, all of which I think are good things. But the modern project of purifying religions to find their essence, particularly their ethical essence, strikes me as perhaps not the best road to go down, or at least unhelpful in the long run. Right? This afternoon raised a fundamental question for me. If happiness is related to goodness, is there one good life that we should find? Or do we construct a good life out of the many possible visions, the many alternatives that are presented to us in unprecedented ways? The philosopher Charles Taylor defines secularism as the awareness of alternatives in ways that previous generations weren't aware of in the same way we are. Let me end. Augustine stands at the extreme end of the Christian tradition. We find happiness, or better yet, holiness, only in the afterlife. This is why critics say Christianity is the opiate of the people. It's a religion for slaves. It's motivated by rewards. It alienates you from the world. The Dalai Lama, I think, has remarked shrewdly that where ethics is concerned, it doesn't seem to matter whether the person making decisions are believers or not. Your ethnicity, your nationality, your religious identity, or even having the right theology can't make you happy or can't make you holy. But this life is not tragic, at least for Augustine. He believed in the goodness of creation. I think C.S. Lewis put the point well in terms of Christianity. We live in a good world that has gone wrong, but still retains the memory of what it ought to have been. For Augustine, we become virtuous through always searching, seeing how God's compassion in Christ models humility and truth. This is time of ours is a school for eternity, a time when there will be no tears, suffering shall cease. And I think Romans 8 is the passage about all creation groaning for its deliverance. I'll end just with two more sentences. <laughs> Modern thought promises us freedom and rationality. Those are good things, but I fear too much of our culture is childish, superficial, anxious, and intellectually tired to meet the demands of the age. 
Much depends on whether or not our generation can find ways to think about and practice religious faith in ways that sustain justice rather than injustice. Whether we can achieve interfaith friendships capable of helping our own traditions move beyond vague but ineffective concern, paralyzing despair, or mild guilt about the world, or losing ourselves in our inward spiritual journey. What I think is we need to think harder about is what is it that really is hard to change about us and about our society? How does constructive change actually happen? I don't have an answer, but I'd be happy to find one. One thing I think I know, we can't give up on each other, lest we worsen the social conflicts that threaten to tear humanity apart today. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to um, begin, as my colleagues did, by, by thanking John Witte and Frank Alexander and Philip Reynolds who have put together the, the Happiness Project that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of for the last five years. And it's been a, I'm not going to say it's been a happy experience, <laughs> although it was <laughs> a cer certainly a very fortuitous experience for me in terms of my own thinking. One of the wonderful things about the project was um, how interdisciplinary it was. So I'll be speaking you, to you today not as a theologian or a, a religious scholar, but as a developmental psychologist, somebody who studies children and families. One of the themes that came across from um, this afternoon's uh, seminar was that the purpose of life is to be happy. And to be happy, we must lead a compassionate life. In, in his writings, His Holiness the Dalai Lama tells us that to be happy is to be loved, that all living things seek love. Um, and he also points to the very earliest experiences that infants have with their caretakers as critical for the development of a sense of who we are in the world and how we value ourselves and others. So I want to focus my comments today on what psychology and developmental science tells us about the development of love. In the 1950s, infants who were ill and needed to be hospitalized were not allowed to be visited by their parents. Hospital staff remarked that these visits were highly disruptive. When the parents left, the infants would become highly distressed and difficult to comfort. When the parents did not visit, the infants were calm and didn't cry. John Bowlby, a scientist who studied both uh, ethology and animal behavior and Freudian psychology, an interesting mix, um, studied these infants and he concluded that they were not calm, they were depressed. They didn't cry because from the infant's point of view, crying was useless. It didn't bring back their parents. Even though all of their physical needs were being met, these infants felt abandoned and unable to affect their environment. Their cries went unheard and they felt unloved. These observations of hospitalized infants are similar to more scientifically controlled studies of non-human primates. Harry Harlow conducted a series of studies in the 1960s in which he reared infant monkeys without their mothers. In one series of experiments, infants were placed in a cage with one of two mannequin monkey mothers. One mannequin mother was just a cold metal steel cage, but this was the, this was the mother that provided all physical needs, food and um, uh, water. The other mannequin monkey the other mannequin mother was warm and uh, fuzzy. She was co covered in terry cloth, but this mother never provided food. It did not meet the infant's physical needs. But when the infant was stressed by noise or by shock in the cage, the infant ran to the terry cloth mother and clung for comfort. The question is, why would the infant prefer the warm and fuzzy mother when in need of emotional comfort over the cold steel mother who had actually provided for their physical needs. There wasn't any learning of the reinforcement of the reduction of physical needs with emotional comfort. Observations and experiments such as these led John Bowlby and his colleague Mary Ainsworth to a theory of mother-infant attachment based not on the reduction of physical needs, and we've been talking about the body, and the body has multiple needs, some of which are just the physical needs of being fed, being warm, being clothed, but there's also other kinds of physical needs, to be comforted, to be soothed, to be held. And that infants bond with their parents, with their caregivers, based on these emotional 
needs, which can be thought of as partly physical, but largely emotional. Infants seek, seek and cling to caregivers who provide comfort and security. And parenthetically, just because the majority of primary caregivers in the world are mothers, I'm going to use the term mother here for convenience. Although all human mother-infant pairs form an attachment bond, the quality of this bond can differ. Mothers who provide sensitive and responsive caregiving, who come when the infant cries and comforts the infant, not just by meeting their physical needs, but also by meeting their emotional needs, by soothing, cuddling, holding, cooing, have infants who come to expect this kind of caregiving. From the infant's perspective, when I cry, I am soothed and my needs are met. I am loved and therefore I am lovable. I can trust that my needs will be met and therefore the world is a safe place. This is a secure attachment bond. From these early experiences, which are really behavioral understandings, embodiments of the caregiving experience, the infant develops a conscious representation of self as loved, others as trustworthy, and the world as a safe place where needs will be met. This secure attachment bond becomes a set of generalized expectations of how this child will go out and meet the world. In contrast, infants who are not fortunate enough to receive sensitive and responsive caregiving learn something quite different. Again, from the infant's point of view, my cries go unheeded, therefore I am not loved. I am not loved because I am unlovable. I cannot trust others to meet my needs. The world is not a safe place. This insecure attachment bond leads to anxiety that needs will not be met and therefore the infant may become even more demanding and clinging. Alternatively, if needs are not met, why bother even trying? No one will help me. The infant becomes avoidant and indifferent to the caregiver. Either anxiety or avoidance leads to a sense that the self is not worthy of love, is essentially unlovable, others cannot be trusted, and the world is not a safe place. So why do these early attachment experiences matter for our adult happiness? These attachment behaviors become the filters through which we interact with the world because securely attached infants and children are not worried about whether their own needs will be met. They're able to be more open to others, to explore the world, to interact with others in more positive ways. In fact, securely attached infants become children who show better social skills and more empathy towards others even as early as kindergarten. Insecurely attached infants do not fare so well because they cannot assume their needs will be met. They develop a defensive stance. One must be careful, vigilant. These infants become children who are more likely to have behavior problems, to act out or to withdraw. They show lower levels of empathy to others. So these early experiences provide a worldview within which the infant and child develops. Early experiences that lead to self-love that I'm a good and worthy person and people will take care of me, paradoxically leads one to actually be less self-focused with an ability to focus more on others in need. Early experiences that lead to a sense of self as unworthy leads to continued anxiety and avoidance and doesn't allow the child to give up their focus on self. Early attachment experiences are critical, but the good news is they are not destiny. Early secure relationships do fortunately buffer children and adults from the unavoidable difficulties we all face in life. And these early positive social experiences build on each other in a positive feedback loop. But although early insecure attachment relationships do lead to anxious and avoidant behavior, these relationships can be repaired. Research with children at risk of developing emotional and behavioral problems indicate that one of the most important factors to get children back on a healthy track is a significant adult mentor. Developing a healthy attachment relationship with an adult, even later in childhood, can lead to positive changes. Relearning these early expectations can be difficult, but it can be done. Learning that you are valued and that your needs will be met helps you learn to value others. Paradoxically then, psychological science tells us that early self-love is a basis for selflessness later. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, the more we love and meet the needs of others, the happier we are. What psychological science tells us is that the more we love and meet the needs of others, the more that they too are able to lead a happy and compassionate life themselves.
Thank you. Um, I too want to thank uh, Amory and the Happiness Project for having been able to participate in it. Um, interdisciplinary opportunities in the academy are very few and far between, and this one was a particularly felicitous one. And I think we all benefited from being stretched and finding what I call uh, threads of understanding that knit us together. And I think threads of understanding is also what's going on in interreligious conversation, uh, which I've been involved in since I was three years old, actually. And um, Rufus Jones, at the beginning of this uh, 20th century, uh, became known as one of those who supported the idea that all religions, all paths lead to the same summit. And that became very popular, uh, I guess, by mid-century. Uh, but as I started to actually study what used to be called the positive religions, I came to conclude that they are not all talking about the same thing at heart. They're asking different questions and giving different answers to those questions. And yet, I've always found, as I was privileged to be Professor Nasser's student when he first came to this country, um, and, and I studied Islam with him, and I studied Buddhism with a Buddhist, and I studied Christianity with Christians, and I studied Judaism with Jews, that there are important threads of understanding through which we can begin to communicate with one another. Um, now, Krista, at, as she uh, opened this panel, uh, invited us to speak both about our own contribution to the conversation through the uh, pursuit of Happiness Project, and our responses to the panel, to the the, uh, the visit this afternoon. And so right now I'm going to really just do the first of those because John Woody asked me to. <laughs> uh, and then maybe later in the conversation I'll respond a little bit more to some of the uh, very interesting and stimulating thoughts uh, from the from the panel discussion. Um, my book that, uh, that, that John referred to um, is about to, to come out. It does come out of the happiness, uh, Pursuit of Happiness Project. And the blurb for it appeared in Publishers Weekly a couple of weeks ago, and the blurb said, oh no, another book on happiness. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Which made Ellen happy. <laughs> yeah, it really made me happy. <laughs> Yeah, like, haven't we had enough books on happiness already? And, uh, of course, that was not terribly encouraging uh, to my publisher. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but I would like to say to the author of that paragraph that uh, it is true we have had a, a, a glut of books on happiness, but we've not had happiness from theologians. Uh, books on happiness from theologians, and particularly uh, not from Christian theologians. In fact, at the very beginning of my project on happiness, I gave a lecture, um, may I say, at Calvin College, and, um, and it was on happiness, and it was very rudimentary. I mean, I haven't even figured out what I was really doing yet. Uh, but I gave this lecture, and on the way out, a gentleman, a very dignified gentleman, walked by me, and he kind of brushed my shoulder, and he said, there are more important things to think about. <laughs> and um, that made me want to write the book even more. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, when I sat down to write the book, uh, which took a very long time actually, I, I thought about happiness and why did I want to write a book on happiness from a distinctively Christian perspective, but even more so from an Augustinian perspective. Um, uh, and the reason was I concluded that Christians are skittish about happiness, as this gentleman was, because they, some, some Christians perceive happiness and goodness to be in tension with one another. And if Christians have a choice between being happy and being good, they want to be good. And they're willing to forego happiness in order to be good and obedient. And so I thought that this was an unfair choice one to have to make. And, um, and I saw along with it that with all due respect to my great master, Augustine, um, he did give, uh, give Christianity and the West to a certain degree uh, the understanding that happiness because, and this did come up in the discussion today, because it is ephemeral, because we will lose all the things, all the money, all the people that we want to hold on to, and this is what makes us so unhappy, um, 
that led Augustine and those who followed him to thinking eschatologically about happiness, that we could only experience bliss in the world to come, and that we should, that this life is a veil of tears and so on and so forth that many of you are familiar with. And I concluded that I thought that was, uh, when I looked at the rest of Christianity's teachings on happiness, I thought that was an imbalance. And so my book uh, is trying to create a middle way between the attack on consumerism that I heard this afternoon, with which I'm deeply uh, sympathetic, and the idea that this life is to be got through until happiness comes on the other side. So I came to uh, want to chop through that kind of dualism and find a both and in the middle. And to do that, I went to, uh, well, I went in all honesty to the Bible. And, um, and the word uh, osher or asher, asher, ashray came up today in, um, in Rabbi Sachs's talk. And if it, it, it's going to come up again tomorrow in Bishop uh, Jefford Shorey's talk, where she goes through and identifies many of the biblical passages that use this word and speak of happiness. And, and I just kind of went for those passages. And I came up with uh, what John identified already. I, I came up with this idea of asherism, and that is a biblical understanding of what it means to be happy. And I think it is both appropriate for the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition. I think some of it may be translatable for Muslims if they are interested in seeing if we could talk about that. And I would be interested to overhear how Buddhists might think about that. So what I concluded is the Jewish and Christian traditions are very interested in having people be obedient to God. That is, um, to the way of life that God puts forth for us in scripture and in the tradition's elaboration of scripture, that originally these traditions are meant, including Christianity, is meant to be offer a way of life, a good way of life, a way of life that is for both the well-being of the community, as John said in his very opening remarks today, but that in enabling the creation to flourish, which is a big phrase for me, when we love, as this is exactly what Eric was just saying, and Robin was just saying, you know, the cross discipline, when we live in a way that enables the creation to flourish, God is pleased and pleased with us for being obedient to enabling the creation to flourish. And when we enable the creation to flourish, we flourish. And when we flourish in that way, we are happy. And finally, I conclude that we and God enjoy one another, enjoying creation. And my, my theory really starts from the doctrine of creation, that God created for God's own enjoyment and pleasure. And being part of that, that is our destiny too. It is not simply to, give, to glorify God, as some traditions put it, but to enjoy fully the life that we've been given to live. And I found this in the scriptural understanding of Ashrei, which is, off, which is attributed primarily to Israel and the Jewish people in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, that to be Ashrei is to be among God's privileged, among the blessed, as, 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 as Bishop Shorey said, to be among the blessed, and to be among the blessed is to be empowered to live this life of beauty, as Professor Nasser says, and of thorough enjoyment of ourselves enjoying the creation and the creation enjoying us. Thank you. I want to um, add to the chorus of uh, gratitude to John Witte and Emery for this day and for tomorrow and for the project that we've been we've been engaged in and to and to Philip for organizing. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and to all of my colleagues. Um, like like Carol, um, I heard in 
today's discussion lots of agreement. And so what I wanted to do was think about questions that might get at sticking points of disagreement. And my instincts are those pretty much expressed by Eric at the end of his talk about some ambivalence about interreligious dialogue. I've been participating in religious, interreligious dialogue not since I was three, <laughs> but um, at least since I've yeah, been, be so yeah, I know, but at least since I've been a professor. Um, and and I, I've been pleased with many of the dialogues I've, I've had an opportunity to share in and yet often leave not exactly certain what's been accomplished. And part of the anxiety has to do with not getting to those sticking points. So, so let me just see if I can offer some questions that might get at them. So first, consider the relationship between the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of holiness. Right, so this was an interreligious summit on happiness, and yet we invited religious leaders who presumably are encouraged um, by their traditions and encourage their flocks to pursue the way of holiness. So what's the relationship between the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of holiness? Between the way of desire and the way of obedience between banquets of bliss and the paths of discipleship. We are inclined to think that these are different matters. In fact, we just heard something to this effect in Ellen's remarks. We're inclined to think that these are different matters, that they somehow stand opposed to each other. But I wonder, can one aim for holiness without also somehow aiming for happiness? And I mean aim for happiness. Not hope for it as an effect of holiness, but intend to achieve it along with holiness. If holiness is what we want, and the participants in many religious traditions speak in these terms, if obedience is the path we choose, obedience to some power, some deity, to some norm, to some ideal, then surely we count these things good holiness, obedience. If we want them, they must be good in some way. Count them good in some way, and surely they are a portion of the happiness we desire. Because, of course, what we desire are good things. When we have them, happiness comes, at least in some measure. If you think obedience and holiness are good, then they must be a portion of the happy life we desire. But we tend to think these things are opposed. Are they? That was my first thought. I think I have four, maybe five. The second is this, and it's related to this first. To what extent can happiness be an achievement? Carol mentioned this in her opening remarks, and she was commenting, I take it, on, on remarks that we heard this afternoon. And to what extent is happiness something we do or something we attain as a consequence of our doings? And, on the other hand, to what extent is happiness a gift? Is it something we receive and for which we should express gratitude? I think, again, Carol mentioned that not very little talk about gratitude. Well, you're not going to talk about gratitude unless you think happiness is a gift, something you've been given. Again, we're inclined to think that these two matters stand in tension, and in a way they do, tension with one another, right? The active part of happiness and the receiving part of happiness. They seem different, but are they? Seems to me, again, this is a question that's on the table and that if you pose to these different religious figures, in fact, we might be able to get somewhere. If, to some significant extent, human happiness is a kind of acting, a kind of willing and loving that requires a certain sort of discipline to will and love a right, then what do we do with the fact that human agency is so often broken? Eric mentioned sin. I'm going to mention sin. <laughs> I'm a Calvinist. Um, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Not a very good one, but I try. Sinful Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> a broken Calvinist, yes. <clears throat> what do we do with the fact that we so often love the wrong things? Now, now you should hear these Augustinian what do we do with the fact that we so often love the wrong things or love the right things in the wrong way or love in the right way but nevertheless find ourselves unable to act in accord with what we love? As I said, in Christian terms, 
how do we square the desire for happiness that we think at least in part has to do with our own agency with the reality of sin, with our brokenness? Third thought, each of our speakers want to say that some measure of human happiness is a temporal possibility. In some measure, it is available to us even now. This was a theme of the talk uh, uh, across all, all, all the remarks, it seems to me, this afternoon. Fair enough. I'm, I'm willing to concede it. And in fact, I think Ellen's work is exemplary in part because she's reminding Christians that this must be so if we affirm the doctrine of the Incarnation. Yes. Um, so I want to say fair enough, but then I want to express doubt. How do we square this wisdom that happiness is available now with what we know of grief and fear, what we know of fragility and oppression, what we know of loss and tears? How do we hold together the wisdom implicit in a comic sensibility, and that's what I heard over and over again this afternoon. How do we hold that comic sensibility, the wisdom implicit in it, together with the tragic realities of so many lives? It struck me, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. it. It struck me that this is very much a Western topic, happiness. Right? We can reflect on it in part because our lives are pretty good. We've got dentists we go to. Right? When I have undergraduates, when I used to teach undergraduates, when I have seminarians who get wistful about the Middle Ages, I teach Middle Ages things, and they think, gosh, things were better in the Middle Ages, I usually say dentistry. <laughs> Right. Eric told me, what was the, the child mortality rate in Augustine's fifth century? Somewhere around 50%. Or yeah. It's 50% or higher. This is why they ran to the church when the infant was born, because it would die within a week. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, there's a part of me that wants to get on board with um, reflection on happiness and to be supportive of the thought that happiness is, in fact, a, uh, a consequence of agency and that agency can be disciplined and happiness is in thus a real possibility, and Christians should expect it, given the doctrine of the Incarnation. And yet, surely so many lives have so little happiness in them. So the question is, how do you square the kind of comic sensibilities on the one hand that there, where there is deep wisdom in, I want you to hear me saying that, and yet square that with the tragic realities of so many lives? The Christian response to this tension has been, this tension between the comic and the tragic is to say that in this life, Happiness is quite often a matter of hope, quite often a matter of promise and anticipation, not a substantial reality. And hope in this vision is the attitude that stretches across the divide between tragic realities and comic endings. Often it has no ground or warrant, and yet quite often it is the best that we can do. Interestingly enough, we heard the Dalai Lama. He was the only one, I think, who mentioned hope. It was very interesting, and I'd like to hear more about that. Lastly, um, I want to defend consumption. <laughs> it's going to take a bit, so you're going to have to bear with me. And, and it has to do with, um, again, I'm, 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 my remarks are very much like Carol's in many ways. I was struck by the accent, for the most part, on <coughs> happiness as an internal state and on um, bodily happiness, external happiness as being important but not quite as important. Right, so Krista pushed the panel on this, and I, which I was very grateful for. Um, and they, all of them started affirming the importance of the body, for the most part. Uh, and this was good. I was happy to hear that. But it, it, was, it was an importance that remained a, of a lesser sort. And here again, I'm speaking as a Christian, um, that, I mean, when Christians assert the presence of God in time, the union of flesh and spirit, assert that about God, assert that about ourselves, insist that human beings are capable of being redeemed and sanctified because of this union, because we are bodily, 
it seems to me we are then obliged to think about the bodily character of human happiness, full stop. Surely happiness in time can be diminished when physical happiness is in absence, when you're broken in body, or you don't have the external goods to support the body that you happen to have, or the bodies that you care for, surely happiness is going to be hard to muster. So too, this is the criticism of consumerism that I'm, I'm, I'm on board with, so too if you've got, um, what, too much physical happiness? I'm not certain how to put this. Too many goods at your disposal, that might threaten your happiness as well. Right? Everyone knows the story of the person who wins the lottery. Right? And we, with schadenfreude, uh, are happy to see them a year later miserable. <laughs> right? Um, Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century Christian theologian, has a prayer. I don't know it exactly, but it goes roughly like this. Oh, oh Lord, um, give me the external goods that I need. Not too much such that my virtue fails, and not too little such that my virtue fails. Notice, however, that this way of putting it, um, this defense of external things and of external happiness, notice how this way of putting it instrumentalizes the body and physical happiness, right? You need physical happiness in order to have mental happiness so you can have virtue. So I think the deeper question is, can physical happiness bodily pleasure, let's make it, let's up the ante, can bodily pleasure be desired not as a means to securing virtue or something else, some spiritual happiness, but can it be desired in and of itself? Can you desire pleasure for pleasure's sake? It's experience. Can that experience be desired in and of itself as an end, full stop? And can that experience be holy and good? I was struck by the rabbi's remark about the sanctification of pleasure. I thought that was spot on, and I think Christians have thought far too little about that. Um, and here's the defense of consumption. At least in the Christian tradition, it's not just, Eric pointed out it's, it's kind of fleshy bodily character, but what Christians do is consume. That's what the Eucharist is. We eat stuff. <laughs> Um, and, and, of course, this is holy and sacred consumption. That's consumption sanctified in a certain way. But we can't have a full-blown critique of consumption. It's just not going to work for Christians. You can't get off the ground. So we have to, and, and that means we can't abandon the body. We have to think about its happiness. And we have to think about the relationship between the spiritual happiness that, yes, should be praised and, and, and the body. And, and let me conclude, and then I'll shut up, about why this matters politically, and this goes to my remark about happiness conferences happening in societies like ours. <laughs> if you accent the internal character of happiness, then it's easy to dismiss external inequalities, external miseries, and put the accent on internal virtue, internal happiness. And in our day and age, right now in America, this seems to be really dangerous. In fact, a really bad idea. So I didn't really know what to expect, <clears throat> and I think what I'd like to do, I think this is very rich, and um, I'd like to um, respond with s some questions and uh, reactions that are raised in me, and then maybe um, let's talk, let's, let's have some interaction among ourselves and then perhaps open it up for 20, 30 minutes, whatever we have left. Um, I want to say that as someone who does a, a public radio program where I interview people from many different traditions and backgrounds, um, I've, I've always said, uh, I, I think something that went wrong in our culture, not just in interfaith encounter and ecumenical encounter, but in the way we celebrated diversity, is how very superficial it was and really boring, right? I mean, I think interfaith is 
I, I try to I try to stay away from that as a as a prefix because it it um, there there hasn't been any substance. I mm -hmm. am drawn to and fascinated by the beautiful and intriguing uh, particularities that different people bring, and that means their differences. I'm interested in the substance of our vocabularies and our virtues and our practices. Um, and I think that th that is the path to us really having something to talk about and, and to give each other and to learn from. Um, so I want to say, also, echoing some of the things that have been brought up here, I, I heard this today, too. I, uh, yeah, the question is, made for happiness? Is that really, is that really the theme of, of, the, of the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament? I mean, <laughs> Desmond Tutu is out there talking about made for goodness, and that may be closer, and it may be very similar, but I don't think it's quite the same thing. Um, and what you heard on the panel today were, uh, on the one hand, a discussion of right relationship with God. You know, let me say, I think that that was something that m maybe the three monotheistic voices, that, that's one way to talk about something they were all saying, saying in different ways. And that is different. Um, right relationship with God is different from, uh, you know, being content within ourselves with, um, with transforming our emotions. Now, it, it, it may be that right relationship with God leads to those things, but still, they're, they're different, they're different uh, things we're talking about. And I, I think it's really important to, to put that out on the table and have those be facts among us. And that I don't think that's a problem, that they're different. Um, boy, my handwriting is getting worse as I get older, and I don't have my iPad with me where I usually type <laughs> these days. Um, yeah, and so, you know, it's, sin, sin is not the same thing as destructive emotions. Again, closely related. Maybe the same thing at times, but not the same categories. I also think something that Robin raises that is a problem for all the traditions is, uh, I mean, I know you were talking about how we can, how we can, there can be healing of those kinds of deep wounds of childhood, but we all know people who carry wounds uh, that will not be changed, I don't think, by, or don't seem to be capable of change by right relationship with God or the calmest of mental states, right? So, so what is that? The, that happiness is beyond some of us, it seems. Also, also by virtue of physical conditions. Um, those are open questions. Now, um, now again, <laughs> when, you, when you say that um, Augustine talking about learning to desire well, I mean, there is a place where you have a Christian statement in the mouth of, uh, you know, the quintessential Christian theologian, church father, that could very well be a Buddhist statement, learning to desire well. That's interesting. It's interesting when we talk out of our particularities and we find vocabulary, we find these very deep echoes. Again, that doesn't resolve anything. It doesn't make us the same, but that's out on the table too. So I think, I think it was you, John, who said that you, I, mean, I got your name right, didn't I, John? Yes, okay, <laughs> Eric, John. All right, um, I think it was you who said that, that uh, your students are not interested in doctrine or theo. This, this was you, Eric. Um, that was Eric, right, sorry. See, I, my, my sense of the spiritual energy and searching in our culture is you're right, that there's not much interest in doctrine, but that there is an interest in theology. And for example, that statement of Augustine to people who are excited by the Dalai Lama as a religious figure uh, would be an exciting statement to mull over. Um, and I also don't think, I mean, obviously there are many different reasons uh, every faith is finds expression and meaning one life at a time, right? And every spiritual search is different. So there are many reasons that people will be drawn to Buddhism or to the Dalai Lama. But I also don't think it's fair to say that, that people are mostly attracted to the fact that it's not about beliefs. I think one thing that's very attractive is how practical it is, how practically realizable. Um, I mean, this gets at something, Ellen, that you bring forward that I, I also would have loved to have had on the table earlier today, that in Western culture, I mean, something that's very attractive about the Dalai Lama as a spiritual teacher and thinker 
um, as an intellect as well as a spiritual teacher, is that we have right, decoupled knowledge and goodness, right? And um, it's not just in Christian theology that happiness hasn't been fashionable. It's not fashionable among educated people. And that's not sustainable for human beings. So we are rediscovering something um, that we need to be whole. Um, so I think, I think what I want to say, um, yeah, and so again, I, and I also, and I think, John, this does speak to, uh, you, you also named some of these very interesting contrasts, happiness versus holiness and obedience. I mean, that's just, you know, those are dramatic those are contrasts, and they, they are on the table, too. But I don't think it's fair to say that this is a Western obsession. I mean, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not a Western figure. Bhutan is the nation that has tried to reform its economy as, uh, in terms of gross national happiness. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a real irony in the West that we have access to so much and therefore the thought of happiness becomes more remote and problematic and tortured for us, uh, right? And that's, that's out there. That's, call that sin. <laughs> call those destructive emotions. Call it what you will. I, I come back um, to a definition of happiness that was given to me by Mathieu Ricard, who is a Tibetan Buddhist monk and the French translator of the Dalai Lama, and he, des he defines happiness as human flourishing. And that hu the human flourishing as opposed to um, a, a, a state of, uh, no, as opposed to, you know, the result of f something pleasurable, rather a state of being in which we can take in every human experience that belongs to a life, which includes not just pleasure and joy, but also sadness and grief and loss. A state of being um, that can experience those, internalize them, and uh, move forward having incorporated them into a sense of self and wholeness. Now, ironically, as I started out saying, I think our differences are important. Again, I think there is a Buddhist definition of happiness that's very compatible with a lot of the definitions that we are searching for here uh, from a Christian perspective. So those are just my reactions to this. Um, I think this is a really important discussion to have after, again, what we had at that stratospheric level, because I was also very fascinated by the, um, you know, by, by the, the differences and, and to some degree the, the dichotomies the, and the paradox that was in that. Um, Paradoxes, I, d I wanted to end with that because the paradox of ecumenical and interfaith encounter, when it is meaningful, in fact, is that we learn as much about ourselves as we learn about the other, right? And that is when it is, in fact, incredibly fruitful. And, and in fact, paradoxically, and it's hard to explain this to people who haven't had these experiences, it, it, is deep in, it deepens identities at the same time that it makes us much more generous towards the identities of others. So let's just tell, you know, let's react to me or to each other or ask questions of each other and then let's open this up for a few minutes. <laughs> Is there an extra bottle of water down there? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll just start uh, just by way of response because I think this is not as important maybe as some of the other themes, but uh, I was noting this uh, Putnam book which is arguing it's actually religious believers who don't care about doctrine anymore. I have to say theology is really popular among my Princeton undergraduates right now, many of whom for whom it's like a foreign language. Yeah. Christianity to them is as exotic as Buddhism to trade in the stereotype. Uh -huh. So exotic. they're very interested in theology. Um, but it's, I, I won't speak for the presiding bishop, but I know many Christian churches that are being torn apart today, not by debates about Christology, but <laughs> by political and cultural issues. Right? So it's a, it's a moment in the history of the church, which I think is unique. 
I mean, uh, every theologian's hope is that theology is the most important thing, <laughs> which hasn't been true throughout the history of the church. But I think we are in a unique moment where the churches, at least within uh, Western Christianity, are being divided by political and cultural things that have something to do with theology. But, but Putnam's book is basically saying America is tolerant because even the believers don't believe in their doctrines. Right. But they practice in ways that extend friendship to others. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not going to comment on that. But I will say that theology is making a comeback on universities. Whether or not there's people to teach theology at universities <laughs> is a separate question. Yes, Ellen. Um, in your remarks, Krista, you mentioned you said the tension between right relationship, which I think was the phrase that that Bishop, Bishop Shorey mm -hmm. brought in early this afternoon, and happiness. And um, and now we're talking about doctrine, especially Christian doctrine. And I I want to kind of try that out. I mean, if people are interested in theology, and students are willing to hear about doctrine because it's more exotic than Buddhism now. Um, let, let, I'd like to just try that. Mm -hmm. um, this also comes from my uh, listening to His Holiness the Dalai Lama speak about compassion and how Christians work out a narrative of compassion through their doctrine. And for Christians, it's through a formalized creed. And it goes something like this, and I think this picks up on all the Augustinian themes. Um, God created the world and it was beautiful. And then we look around and we see something's wrong. It's not what it was created to be out of the work of a, of a good and loving and happy God. And that's called, Christians call it the, the fall. Jews might call it exile. Experience of exile, of losing your place, using your land. And then comes the next stage. This is a grand, this is what we no longer can talk about. We can no longer talk about grand narratives, but this grand narrative will somehow not be repressed. If your undergraduate Christians have been all taught there's no narrative and they're seeking a narrative. That is, they're seeking a frame of reference within which to locate their lives so that their personal narrative can find a, large, a place in a larger narrative. So for Christians, it goes like this. So it was supposed to be right. It's not right. And then the understanding on Christian terms is then we need help, right? Because we're, we're messing it up. You know, you have Babel and you have all these bad things. And so there's a need for help. And so Christians call this the incarnation, God entering bodies and in entering the body, the human body, fully and utterly, and not only the human body, but the human self in its entirety, it means that human beings participate in this drama of redemption, this narrative of the reclamation of the cosmos from its dissolution, as, as Athanasius would have put it. And in that entering into the fullness of humanness and its fallenness, God goes into the suffering itself. Augustine did talk about um, a, a sin as learning to desire well, but he also talked about it as the healing of love, that our loves are distorted, our love is broken, and that this bizarre notion of God entering time and space is healing that relationship by taking humanity up into the very life of God, and then through this, the continuation of this myth, in, in, in resurrection, that means life out of death, and finally the ascension in its purification, and its, or its, its glorification and culmination. And the question, I think, for your undergraduates, even some of our seminarians, seminarians um, is can these bones live? Put use Ezekiel's terms. Can we I'm speaking now for Christians. Can Christians, one of my students in a class one day said, you know, our language is really dusty. Our language is really dusty. And that's the doctrine. That's maybe why uh, Lord Sachs said theology is boring. I know other Jews who say theology is boring. And it's because it's dusty. And can this narrative, which is understood to be a narrative of all of creation, and it's life and death and resurrections and rebirths and redeaths, um, can these bones live? 
especially in a culture where the imagination of my undergraduates for what is Christianity is displayed for them, at least, within certain political mobilizations of Christianity in America. But, and, it, and it's more than that as well, because it, it's not the, can these bones live, but they're going to live only as other bones die. Right. <laughs> that is to say, because there is, I mean, the Pursuit of Happiness Project in some respects is about America. We, we begin with the Declaration, and there's a sense in which the American narrative has something to do with um, coming here, remaking yourself, abandoning a past where happiness was not possible to a future where it might be. That's still a part of our students, both undergraduates and seminarians. And here you've got a, a different sort of story that, that, that Ellen gave in abridgment where um, it's a different kind of happiness. It leads to a different sort of set of practices, a different set of virtues. Um, it's not Even, just can these dry bones live, but whether can this other competing narrative, in fact, be chastened somehow. But, but both narratives are narratives of redemption. They are both narratives yes. of redemption. And I think that's yes. really important because one of, the, one of the things that we haven't talked a lot about is hope. And, you know, can you be happy without hope? And when you talk about trauma and early trauma, when you become hopeless is when you fall into depression and states that become more and more difficult to create any kind of personal happiness or relationship happiness. So I think we do, we need to talk about redemption, about hope. And I'm, I have a question about gratitude. Is it the case that we can only have gratitude for things we haven't worked for? Can't we can't we work hard and still be grateful that we achieved it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, in other words, no, no, no. I mean, my, my first question was try to soften up the divide between being given happiness yeah. and achieving it. And oh, it might oh, these yeah. things yeah. be not so much intention. And if they're not so much intention, then presumably gratitude can be yeah. a response to your doings and your achieving. I'd like to. Or, to or take having the opportunity to work for something absolutely. and achieve it. I, I, I want to take things in a slightly different direction because it's, it's, it's been bugging me again about, uh, I suppose, the question of the status of happiness as related to the human. I mean, we, we've looked at the language of, are we made for happiness? Do we have a right to happiness? We, but somehow it's seen as central to what it means to be human. I still want to know, if we grant that, what are the ethical implications of that statement? Right, but then you have to define happiness before you ask that question. Human flourishing will do just fine. Flourishing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, flourishing will do fine. Okay. Flourishing. Ethical implications. Of, a, of, a, of an assertion that this is central. Now, one way you could say it is it's up to you. Right. The other way of putting it is saying, no, that's inadequate. And so something else follows. And I guess that's what I would like to... Because I think we, we keep coming up to the, the beyond the individual, but backing away from what would follow from these commitments. Mm -hmm. so I, I think that uh, th this is really a uh, very important question, that uh, if happiness, as let's say for humans, human flourishing, although happiness probably should extend to animals as well, um, but uh, the, if the very basis for pursuing happiness is, uh, let's say, the, the certain uh, religious traditions, for example, in Christianity, if it has to do with the, you know, that we, we are created by the God, and if the intention of God is for everyone to be happy and so forth, let's set that aside. If, if, if we think of in a more like universal or secular sense, uh, if we take this into account that uh, each of us wants to be fulfilled, you know, let's say each of us desires uh, satisfaction. If the flourishing encompasses that sense of fulfillment and the satisfaction, if you, mm -hmm. you will, then really th the, the reason for pursuing happiness is it's given. That is that we all want to be happy, we w deep down we all aspire for happiness, then the question comes that if that is the case, how do we go about achieving happiness? And uh, there 
I think that on one level, in terms of uh, in terms of ethical mm -hmm. uh, question, uh, the at least in the Buddhist tradition, the way it is uh, seen is that everything, you know, whether it's happiness or the unhappiness, suffering, they come from cause and conditions, and that it is the cause and conditions that lead to the results. Certain cause and conditions lead towards unhappiness, certain cause and conditions promote that flourishing or happiness. So looking at what kind of conditions in terms of, you know, we can think of external conditions, you know, having th the better houses and the more money and so forth and so on, certainly, and the medicine and so forth, certainly they do contribute to certain degree of our well-being. You know, that, that one of the, the first century Buddhist masters uh, known as Aradeva was very kind of, the, I think that, uh, you know, observant where he says that the chola yiki dunge te tamenala luikisos, that in uh, what he says that privileged one are tormented by mental suffering, underprivileged tormented by physical suffering. That, that's, you know, that you, do you look at the first, uh, those uh, materially underprivileged ones, if we don't have enough medicine, if we don't have enough food, a uh, place to live, you know, there is a is, is very physical dimension of the suffering. But when we uh, accomplish, you know, the good living standard, you know, that we have the good roads, cars, and the, all those things, then does, uh, do uh, we kind of feel accomplished and fulfilled and satisfied, or there are other sets of things that torment us, like the anxieties, the depression, and the and sense of alienation, and so forth and so on. So in terms of the conditions, there are external conditions that certainly uh, are necessary. But uh, from a tr Buddhist tradition uh, perspective, uh, there are m internal conditions that are more kind of that when those uh, certain conditions are met, external you know, inner conditions, if we don't pay attention to them, if we behave uh, violently, if we, uh, you know, treat others uh, violently or the negatively, if we uh, remain, kind of, if we act, you know, in unhealthy ways, that actually promotes more of unhappiness. And further, if we respond certain uh, unhealthy uh, ways in our attitudes, you know, with anger and jealousy and so forth, that also promote un unhappiness. So uh, from a personal point of view, it uh, only makes sense that if we want to uh, achieve the very happiness that we so deeply seek, that we deeply aspire, we have to pay attention to our actions. You know, that means to l have a right speech, you know, a right action, you know, right livelihood, you know, that act well. Uh, and uh, that also has to do with how we treat each other. But there is more to that, and you know, in at the, the, this ethical dimension extends to kind of treating others well. That I also not simply because I want to be happy, and the, you know, my happiness comes from me acting well, um, and therefore I should not uh, act harmfully and so forth. But recognizing that, like me, every one of us wants to be happy, and therefore, you know, if we can. Uh, find a way to truly recognize that, embrace that, then it uh, has to do with how we can assist and help others, and it promotes compassionate uh, ethical behavior. So, uh, you know, from personal perspective, avoiding harmful actions and so forth, from recognizing that the happiness is the kind of the birthright, as his holiness would say, of everyone, there then the ethic, ethics of compassion comes. Yeah. Just quickly on this, I, I think this the implications for individual ethics and also for social ethics. There's uh, Hannah Arendt, who was a very prominent political philosopher in the 20th century, was a critic of compassion mm -hmm. because she worried that compassion leads to a kind of paternalism or an attitude of pity towards others. Now, compassion and pity are rightly distinguished, I understand. But uh, I think the, the, the difficult question, particularly, let's say, in, the, in terms of American social ethics, 
um, where there's a, a strain of a kind of individualism that, is, has, that worries when someone says, I'm doing this for you to make you happy. Right? <laughs> And then you sort of lock your doors and worry about what people are going to do to make you happy. But I think what, one of the things we've, uh, the, the phrase human flourishing indicates maybe a kind of um, at least some confidence that there are some goods we judge to be necessary for human flourishing and well-being of all. And part of our social contract is to provide them. So debates about public education, debates about health care, it's not just about the inner happiness. Mm -hmm. This language of the pursuit of happiness, I think, is bound up with important political questions that I think John was getting hinting at with the attention to inequality. Now, we, that doesn't mean we've solved the problem or answered you know, a perennial question about the liberty of the individual and community well-being. But I think the language of happiness actually is more uh, complex than just personal happiness in the way that it has been uh, interpreted in a lot of American right. history, and that it might be a good turn to a kind of social uh, goods. Now, Augustine, of course, was much more confident about what constitutes human flourishing than any modern liberal would be. So it's going to be a hard question about what are on our list of things we all know, not what people want, but what they need. And this goes back to Krista's opening uh, question this morning about the relationship between happiness and the good life. Right, right. Which, uh, and the good life is actually a term I think I would like to see be featured more precisely because of its combination of the pleasure, the satisfaction, and the moral dimension. Uh, good is a term that is, um, is, is brilliantly multifocal. But I, I, may I speak also to the notion of compassion and empathy? The, it, it, in um, psychology, the distinction is often made between sympathy and empathy. And empathy requires the ability, a cognitive ability, to put yourself in the other person's mm -hmm. state of mind and to understand from their perspective, right, right. which is why, which is so that compassion might be paternalistic if it's done as I know what's best for you. And by the way, sometimes that's true. Sometimes parents know what's best for kids, even when kids don't agree. <laughs> um, so there are times when we, when we do have to make decisions for other people. Um, but I think true empathy is when you can take the perspective an, of another person and see what is the good for them and affect a change to, to do a good for them. And even in terms of some of the political discourse, for example, health care reform, who makes the decision about how you should have healthcare delivered to you, what you need, what you want. Um, so I do think we need to make a distinction between uh, sort of a paternalistic uh, compassion and, and more of a true empathy. And I do think that what we know from the developmental psychology, from the development of children, that kind of empathy is slow to develop. I mean, it, it takes years, um, and there are huge individual differences in how empathic people are and in their ability to really understand the other person's perspective, some of which is related to these early childhood experiences. I think that bringing up health care reform is a good way to remind us all that this happiness discussion is complex. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellen and John, do you want to say? I have one more thing. Okay. Yeah, so, and this is, in, I think, in relation to Carol's mm -hmm. worry, which I thought was really good. Um, and it's related to the paternalism question. I mean, there's a sense in which, in certain settings, in certain circumstances, the happiness question is the wrong one, right? And attending to happiness, in fact, is the wrong attention, yeah. right? So David Hume has this great example. You suppose you're, um, you meet a, a beggar um, lying against a fence. The beggar has uh, gouty toes, no shoes, gouty toes, and you give them a swift kick causing this person intense pain. Now, you can talk about happiness. We certainly want empathy in response to this. Um, and you can talk about the happiness lost, so on and so forth. But what really matters here is that you've got no right to kick this person's toes. And that this person has a right to call you on it and say, no, you don't. Period. Happiness aside. Um, 
and maybe they could be angry about it. I and mean, they that was should another be that was an emotion we exactly. that got sort of downplayed. Precisely. But righteous anger, I think, is an emotion within the Christian Precisely. tradition that would have a nice dialogue with the Buddhist yeah, tradition. But the, you know, I can say, well, this makes me happy to kick your toes, and I really don't care about the, your loss of happy. That it doesn't matter. This, this is not the issue. I saw you wanting to say something. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't sure. I, I will speak, though, to this point of, of righteous anger. Righteous anger has a very important place. But from my personal experience and that of my people, it can become a way of life. And when it becomes a way of life, and it becomes the frame through which everything is filtered, the only narrative, then I fear that psychologically it turns back on us and starts to harm us because it infuses the whole self. And then other blessings have trouble piercing inside that frame of anger. And that's why I think being able to claim multiple narratives and work hard at how those narratives are, are in tension with one another, where there are permeable membranes, uh, is extremely important. I mean, I was thinking before I left, I had a, 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 a phone call from, I, I care for a man serving life sentence in prison. And about four weeks ago, he fell on the stairs, and he has very serious problems in one of his legs, and his leg, his knee snapped, and they had to carry him to the infirmary, and it was on a Saturday, and there were no medical personnel, and they said they'd call him Tuesday for uh, an x-ray, and so on and so forth. And nothing happened, and nothing happened. And so I called the prison, and he was, and, and I did get to the right supervisor, and they were able to, and he called me very excited. He said, I was seen by a medical personnel, and they're going to do an MRI, and they're going to put me on Celebrex, and he was very excited. And then yesterday, as I was preparing to leave, he called me and said, they called me down again, and there's another Ms. Physician or PA or whoever it was said, all of that's gone, no, med no Celebrex, no mm -hmm. painkiller, no MRI, just get over it. Your leg is deteriorating, it's gonna get worse as you get older, forget about it, just get used to the pain. And my job is to try to give him, what, what can I give him? What narrative can I give him of hope? talk about agency he so somehow in all of these narratives and all these tensions I have to struggle to give him some hope when I our hope his and my hope it keeps being dashed to nothing and yet I can't give up the idea that there has to be some narrative something for us to hold on to and maybe it is in being able to see through more than one narrative. His suffering is meaningless. He committed murder now. I mean, he's in jail because he committed murder. He murdered a friend of mine. But still, where is a place in this talk of happiness? It's not a word I would ever use with him, you know. But, but that's why this is a serious conversation. And I, I think I'm privileged to participate in it, and I think we all are, and there's a point at which we have to take ourselves very seriously about it. Well, I actually think that's a good stopping point. Is there a burning question in the audience? Uh, I didn't uh, had a chance to listen to the uh, first uh, session. Uh, your podcast wasn't working uh, for some reason. Uh, but anyway, uh, by listening to the, the conversation between the religions to create some harmony, I think there's a great deal of hypocrisy in that. Because I, I think uh, uh, it is every religion is trying to present some image that trying to show this peacefulness of the religion. And in the reality, there's a, when there are two opinions, they are so rigid, 
there's no way they can come together to really uh, be a constructive uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, process to uh, help the humanity. And as far as the happiness goes, it seems like we are approaching the happiness as a product. We are trying to sell something. And, uh, and there's a great deal of assumption that I have, is, uh, obviously there was a lot of assumption, but we don't challenge our assumption. We allow us to go on with our opinion and ideas, but those assumptions confuse us more. So we are not willing to break down these assumptions and be truly uh, honest with each other because humanity is a mistake. This is not an entertainment about real, you know, selling an uh, uh, idea about the happiness. But my question is that as long as one is, has been mentioned uh, in the panel, is full of all this pain and suffering, and eventually, because it knows that it's suffering, is pursuing the happiness. And the pursuing of happiness is we confused by pleasure. And so we are talking about pleasure in place, uh, happiness in pleasure of pleasure, and we are addicted to pleasure. And our society has been programming our children to be addicted to pleasure. So how we overcome this enormous challenge, because if we are not happy, if we are not peaceful human beings, no matter how much we talk about, how much books we read, how much uh, ancient wisdom we bring, it has nothing to do with anything. So we have to be really, how we open our hearts and suspend our, our own opinion and judgment and beliefs and put all that garbage aside so we can meet each other. If we are not going to do that, I don't think no 100 years we can talk about happiness, it doesn't make it any sense. I, I, I think that that's one way of, saying again what Ellen, telling the story Ellen told, there's echoes there. So we, we really do need to finish. Um, we have a couple of questions. We're not going to tie either of these up, but are there final, final words people would like to speak? I was just going to say again, going back to the, uh, the, the question about source goal, this very differently, uh, the, uh, the Greeks had no question that happiness was pursued as a, as a goal. Now they had very refined notions of what that meant. Um, but it's really not that way in the biblical tradition. And I think uh, Bishop Jeffrey Shorey was correct today when it's, it's the focus on the relationships. And when those are in right order, flourishing happens. And when those are not in right order, flourishing ceases to happen. And the story is told over and over and over again. Just quickly, one, uh, as someone who is attracted to the Augustinian tradition and has a certain pessimism within it, I do want to maybe offer one reason for hope um, and the need for these sorts of dialogues. Um, in a sense, it's, it's up to us. I mean, I watch television and get angry and lament. Um, and I, I think John mentioned the comic and the tragic. The comic, in some ways, for me, is much more horrible <laughs> because it's faded. There seems to be nothing but just laughing at human folly. Tragedy indicates hope for a possibility of something better and maybe a resolution. And, um, you know, B.B. King said, no one loves me except my mother and she might be lying too. You know, <laughs> we can live in that world and worry about the few bad apples and we can fool ourselves. Maybe I agree with you. We can't just say this religion is of peace and this religion is of peace. It takes a lot of work. And part of that work just begins in forming friendships. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but I think it's up to us. And we can't just sit in a theater and complain about who's on cable television. Should that be our last word? OK, thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.